for Latin American Studies and the Embassy of the Argentine Republic. Uh, my name is John Binns. I'm the director of ANCLIS, the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. And we're very pleased to be able to present here a speaker, perhaps one of the most important speakers that we presented uh, at the ANU through ANCLIS, uh, Luis von der Brode. Uh, I'm going to introduce Luis shortly and say a little about him. But before I do that, I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, the Embassy of the Republic of Argentina and the Ambassador, Mr. Pedro Viagra Delgado, who's here tonight, and ask him to say a few words of introduction and of welcome uh, for the meeting. Thank you, John. Well, good evening to all. I, as you mentioned, this is a good example of collaboration between uh, ANCLAS, the Australian National University, and in this case, the University of Argentina. It is uh, probably one of the most important uh, uh, evenings for us here because uh, Dr. von der Brieder and the Argentine team of forensic uh, anthropology has done a fantastic job, um, not only in Argentina but also in the rest of the world, in identifying the remains of people who were killed in the times of the military dictatorship and also uh, have contributed enormously to identifying some of the kids that were at the time misappropriated by the military into other families. You worked with the uh, Abuela de Plaza de Mayo, with the mothers of Plaza de Mayo as well. So it is a real uh, privilege and uh, the this team has become one of the leading groups in this matter around the world. Now they're working uh, also in a project in Timor with the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, Dr. Soren Blau is here, okay. and thank you for being with us tonight. I think this, uh, what um, Dr. von der Brieder is going to present us on the work they have done, is really something that uh, uh, we value enormously in Argentina, and certainly we're trying to project that uh, values to to other parts of the world and trying to cooperate in a number of, uh, of cases in which they can bring their expertise. Expertise acquired in the worst possible circumstances, I would say, because it is the result of a very bad experience in Argentina that uh, at least produced this uh, good result of having one of the best teams of forensic anthropology in the world. Uh, Dr. von der Rieder, many thanks for being here with us tonight. Uh, we have been exchanging emails until today that we met. We've done a couple of things together before, even in the, some of you will remember the itinerant show that we had on the, on the Abuela de Plaza de Mayo uh, and the mothers about uh, at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, and uh, the, the e, EAF uh, managed to join that in the show that we did in Melbourne. Uh, it was a bit too late to do it in Canberra, and, uh, and we did it later in Sydney, but in Melbourne you, you joined us, and that was a real privilege, I, it was very good. At that time I was myself uh, uh, suffering the effects of a head of a broken ankle, so I couldn't be there, but, uh, but I know that everything went very good, and uh, uh, very well. And so I thank you very much again, and uh, I hope that uh, we will learn quite a lot from your presentation here. And again, thank you very much to Anglas. And this is going to be just the beginning. Uh, we have the bicentennial in 2010. So, John, you have a lot of work. You were just uh, mentioning this uh, conference you have in July. The number of papers you have received that's uh, just giving you the idea that uh, we Latins, contrary to what people tend to think, we are going to put you to a lot of work. So, right. I'd, uh, I'd just like to say a few words about uh, Dr. Luis von der Breide. He is, as you know, an Argentine forensic anthropologist. He is also the co-founder and the current president of the Argentine forensic anthropology team. It was founded in 1994 and now has headquarters in Buenos Aires and offices in New York, South Africa and Mexico. Through the application of forensic anthropology and archaeology, genetics and related sciences, and in collaboration with the relatives of victims and other investigative bodies, the team aims to shed light on cases of human rights violations and thus contribute to the search for justice, for reparation and the prevention of further human rights violations. The team has worked in nearly 40 countries throughout Latin America, Africa, Asia and Europe. 
and its advisors, its members serve as expert witnesses, technical consultants and advisors to local and international human rights organisations, national judi judiciaries, international tribunals and special commissions of inquiry such as truth commissions. The team provides relatives with information about the fate of their loved ones and returns their remains for reburial ceremonies. The team also aims to have a longer term impact by training forensic experts to continue this work in their own countries, including helping to form new forensic teams dedicated to human rights work. It's helped to set up forensic teams in Chile, in Guatemala, in Zimbabwe, South Africa and Cyprus. Dr. Fonderada is a specialist in the historical investigation of cases of political violence, in the analysis of written and oral sources, the collection of anti-mortem data from relatives of the missing, interviewing witnesses, the archaeological exhumation of individual and mass graves, and the analysis of human remains in order to identify them and to help to establish the cause of death. He's worked as an expert witness in 900 cases in Argentine courts and abroad. And the list of countries in which he's participated in forensic investigations is much too long to, to read out here. Dr. Fonderbrider teaches forensic anthropology at the annual course of legal medicine of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Buenos Aires. And it's a great privilege to welcome him here tonight to the ANU as our guest at ANCLIS and at the Embassy of the Argentine Republic. Thank you. There is good to Good night, buenas noches. Really want to thank the Argentine Embassy in Australia and ANCLA for this invitation to share with you some experiences we have been accumulating in the last 26 years in my country and all parts of the world where after periods of political violence, the society requests to investigate what happened with the missing people to try to find justice, memory, and reparation for the victims and big part of the society. The idea of this talk is to show how through the use of different forensic and scientific disciplines it's possible to contribute in this process of truth, justice and memory in different contexts around the world. Our world is just a little piece of, of, uh, of work which is totally related to the world of the human rights organizations which have been always around the world, the people have been in the main front uh, requesting truth and justice. So the idea is to show how it's possible to the use of science to bring some light and some, some relief for the families of the victims. Let me start with some, some context. As you know, since the 60,000 of people have disappeared, been kidnapped and murdered as a consequence of processes of political, ethnic and religious violence in different <coughs> parts around the world. The states very often in military control have been the most responsible for these crimes, although some ESG groups have used these practices as, for example, in Latin America in the 80s and today in Peru and Colombia. In some contexts, especially in some African countries, the ethnic element in the conflict is very important, not only the political. Once violence stops and new political spaces are opened up, the need to investigate what happened with the missing people is a key element in the transitions to democracy. And the victims' organizations, human rights organizations, and the mothers and abuelas in my country play a key role asking for truth and for justice to different ways. And in that process, we have to keep in mind which is the modus operandi we see in different countries in the kidnapping of people. Usually, the victim in legal detention and disappear the person, or the victim kidnapping, transferred to a legal or illegal detention center, torture, killing and the body disappear. Very often we have fake or real confrontations between state security forces and guerrilla movements, resulting in the robbery and disappearance of dead guerrilla remains. And very often we see also these confrontations and the bodies are left in open fields for many years. This has been a main modus operandi in many countries, not only in Latin America, we see as a pattern in different contexts. What happened to the bodies? Usually are buried in cemeteries, in clandestine graves, or in crop lands, in military compounds, ravines, thrown to the water, to the sea, as happened in my country, burned, destroyed. But for the families, the consequence of this process is always the same. It's not just the family, it's the whole community. In most of the country where we work, the main victims are people living in the countryside, peace and indigenous population, where the concept of community is as strong as the family. And for them, it's been terrorized through this process 
and waiting always for a response from the state, which very usually the better response solution. Different mechanisms have been created in the last 25 years to deal with the past. The most usual are the so-called truth commissions, and also local and adult international tribunals are the most common use in the last years. But also we have permanent tribunals, and special prosecutor offices, UN commissions, bicommunal commissions, parliamentary commissions, and also in some contexts like in Rwanda, traditional process to deal with these kind of events. All of them have been put in place for a specific period of time. These are examples of, from different parts of the world, as in my country in 1983 and 84 was one of the first truth commissions around the world. Um, some of them were created by the new presidents, others were created by the United Nations, as in El Salvador, Guatemala, with different success and different replies uh, to the families. The main objectives of these mechanisms investigate violation of human rights and international humanitarian rights committed in the past, look for common patterns about what happened in those processes, function for a limited period of time, produce a final report, and make recommendations. These have been the main objectives of these truth commissions. In all these processes, science began to play an important role, beginning in Argentina in 1984. We tried to see for signs of torture, to prefer autopsies of dead bodies, perform examinations, try to analyze, to analyze skeletal remains, identify the remains, establish the cause and manner of death. So science to different disciplines have been trying to collaborate with these commissions and these mechanisms about the past. Some concrete examples of the role of every specific expert, pathologists, anthropologists, odontologists, radiologists, archaeologists, all of them trying to work in, in, in multidisciplinary teams but also the role played by history, social anthropology, journalism in this process of investigation in some steps of the process as we see later. The forensic cases, this kind of investigation, have some kind of particularities according to the context. First of all, we need to see the, what is the political context. In some countries it's impossible to perform these investigations, so it's important to see which is the, the political attitude, not only in the country but outside at an international <coughs> level. It makes a strong difference if UN is involved or not in this process of investigation. Who is in charge of the cases? There is a prosecutor, there is a commission, or a mechanism, which is for instance the local system, the capacity, the credibility in the population, particularly in the families of the victims, how is done the preliminary investigation of each case. If the events happen in the city, in the countryside, cultural and religious aspects, the context where we are working the relation with the law, the importance of the relatives of the victims, human rights organizations, the expectation of the victims about the possibility to find the remains, to identify them, the presence of perpetrators, usually in this process the perpetrators are free, living among the community, security, the media, logistics, and funding. All these aspects we have to keep in mind when we began a process to investigate the past, using the law science in that kind of processes. Going to Latin America, some numbers, uh, the main country who missing people in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. Guatemala is the country with more disappeared, 250,000. Colombia, the process is still happening with killings, kidnappings. El Salvador, Peru, Argentina, Chile are still looking for the missing people through different forensic teams. And torture, unfortunately, still is a reality in our country in political and criminal cases quite often. What happened with investigations? From the very beginning, it's very strongly conditioned by several factors, namely a strong presence of human rights organizations involving the victims' relatives, little or no independence of forensic institutions, very often complicit with the crimes in different ways, lack of information about border size, an almost complete lack of interest from the academic world to get involved in these kind of investigations in a concrete way. Also, after the initial period of interest, the state interest continuing with investigation goes low. There's no more interest to keep working and looking for missing people. And decline also with the international support in these kind of cases. And very often, as I mentioned before, perpetrators are free, and very few cases we have uh, uh, judicial processes. Going to the case of Argentina, as you know, the population concentrated in big cities. And during, between 1976, when we have the coup d'etat, until 1993, it was a long tradition of military interventions in my country. 
between 1974, two years before the military cap, until 1993, around 10,000 people disappeared. For the human rights organization, the figure is 30,000. The pattern of disappearances, urban kidnapping of the people, torture, taking a legal detention center, and then the execution of the people. We use a concentration camp system. There were more than 300 in the whole country operating in military units and police offices. Use of airplanes to drop the bodies to the sea or to the river. Kidnapping of babies, boring captivity. Around 500 women were kidnapping were being pregnant and the babies were stolen. And a double level of participation of the state at bureaucracy deep traces is one of the main ways for us to look for the missing people, not only in Argentina, but also in other countries, when we have a level of bureaucracy of the states leaving traces in different kind of documents we try to investigate. In 1983, the new president, Dr. Lafoncine, created our truth commission to investigate what happened. The commission established in 1984, almost 9,000 people disappeared. The large majority of disappeared persons were being kidnapped, taken to illegal detention centers, tortured and killed by the security forces, mainly between 1976 and 1978. This is a map showing uh, part of the city of Buenos Aires with the location of some clandestine centers. One very famous called Escuela Mecánica de la Armada in the main center of the city. Most of the bodies of disappeared people were disposed in one or two ways. They were thrown from military airplanes into rivers and the Argentine Sea, or they were buried without name in cemeteries in the whole country. In 1985, began the trial to the former military juntas. Um, the head of the prosecutor, Dr. Chacera, presents 700 cases to be prosecuted with very good information. Most of the perpetrators in these cases were sentenced to life imprisonment, but amnesty laws, they were free again between 1989 and 90s. But since 2000, there were new processes in the country, and today there are more than 400 people in jail waiting for process or being prosecuted. And what happened with the missing people, with the bodies? At the beginning of the democracy, the judges and prosecutors began to order exhumations in cemeteries around the country. But these exhumations were problematic in several ways. In the first place, the medical, the official forensic people in charge of these cases had little experience with exhumations. And they lost a lot of information, bonds, and other evidence. Uh, there was heavy equipment without looking, without working with other forensic disciplines. And a lot of evidence was lost in those years, 1983, 1984. But also, the judicial doctors were part of the systems. The families of the victims didn't trust in the official forensic doctors. This is a situation we see in many countries around the world. So during non-democratic period, the independence is quite limited. And the relative assist to these exhumations, looking how bulldozers or great diggers remove graves and put the bones in these conditions. So it was obvious was need to have another mechanism to deal with these kinds of investigations. So, after 83 began a new process in Argentina in that sense, the Graduate Truth Commission, trials, uh, some laws preventing investigations. In 2005 was created the right to truth for the tribunals in Argentina to investigate what happened. And as I mentioned before, some numbers of children found and today, bodies identified, and the process of memory in the whole country. So at the middle of 1983, an institution called Grand Miles of Plaza de Mayo were looking for the children. And they were looking some kind of scientific technique to establish the link between the children who disappear and the grandparents. They visited several labs around the world, and finally they found a, a good place in the United States, University of Berkeley. They sent a group of scientists to Argentina to collaborate in this process. Um, at that stage, we were a group of students at the University of Anthropology, Archaeology, Medicine, Law. Um, we got a request from one of the members of the delegation of Forensic Anthropologists to help with some exhumations. We didn't know too much about science, we knew about politics. So we said, why not? We keep talking and talking about politics. Now we have a concrete opportunity to do something to the science. So in 1984, we created this institution as a forensic independent alternative for the relatives of the victims to try to investigate what happened. With a special emphasis on the rights of the relatives and communities 
and it's in to them to know what happened and to participate in the process, to provide evidence in court as expert witness, to assist the relatives in this process, to collaborate in the training of new teams in different countries, and also to participate in the historical reconstruction about what happened first in our country and then in other countries where we request our services. So since 1986 until 2000, we have worked in all these places, investigating cases of political violence, um, and sometimes providing training, but also trying to collaborate with the justice when it's possible according to each specific context. Just going more specifically, the kind of work we can do using sciences. The investigation is divided in several steps. The first one is historical investigation, trying to recover different kind of information from different sources. We try to collect information about the missing people. What we found usually are skeletons, no flesh bodies. We don't have fingerprints. We don't have dental records because the population affect usually don't have access to odontologists or to doctors. Try to find the great sites, recover the remains, and try to investigate what happened to this person, to recover, to identify them, and to determine the cause of death. The first stage are the documents I mentioned before. The, at the beginning, we thought there were no information about what happened with the missing people. Um, at some point, we said, well, we need to understand how it was working the state in those years to understand the bureaucracy of the states and all the traces in different offices. So we began to investigate different kind of uh, reports, dividing written sources and oral sources. Written sources, legal reports produced by the government, NGOs, police and military reports, intelligence reports, uh, information that could be provided by uh, judicial files, uh, information produced by the media in those years, and also documents produced by the academic world. But at the same time, we began to work with uh, oral sources, interview with family members, witnesses, uh, fellow activists, dentists, sometimes with perpetrators. So the approach was to combine the classical forensic uh, disciplines as medicine and ontology with social anthropology, history, and all this way could contribute to reconstruct what happened with someone who disappeared. The objective of the primary investigation, who, what, when, where, and how, to cut with hypotheses before going to a specific area to look for the bodies, and to try to locate the grave, identify the remains, the identity of the perpetrator, and reconstruction of the event. Some examples of these uh, sources, first of all, we had to understand what happened in our country, the military division of the country in those years, or according to the responsibility of different forces. It's a map of the city of Buenos Aires, the location of different illegal detention centers, the location of different cemeteries where the bodies were taken after people were killed, which is the violation of these cemeteries, the red spots with those detention centers. We read thousands and thousands of documents of t testimonies of people produced in front of these truth commissions, lists of the victims, documents produced in the judicial proceedings we had since 1985 in Argentina, <clears throat> also documents produced by military tribunals that we had in Argentina in 1974, 1975. These were now confidential documents that were found in, in judicial offices and we began to investigate and we found very important information. Intelligent reports uh, in Latin America were found around four important archives with intelligent reports about repression in Argentina, in Brazil, in Paraguay and in Guatemala where lists of missing people, pictures, um, all kind of information very important were found and we are working with that, that data. Documents produced by the local American embassy in our countries, very important information we found after 25 years. Uh, cable sent from the US embassy in Buenos Aires to the United States. We found important information also that will uh, help us to establish some links. As I mentioned before, police and military records, pictures, fingerprints of the victims, Fingerprints of the course, sometimes we can compare the fingerprint of the body with the fingerprint of the person who was taken originally before disappear. Mortuary records, people sometimes think it's impossible, there are no records. We found, not just in Argentina, this is an example from Argentina, but in many countries, there was someone just taking notes. Death certificates, establishing the cause of death, the location of the body. 
information we found in the media. Very often the journalists are the first people to arrive. We work with collection of uh, journals from different periods to start with what happened day by day in different parts of the country. And also the collection of what we, we call anti-mortem information, the physical information about the victim, trying to build a relation of, of confidence and trust with the families, respect cultural and religious context, interview with different members of the family, more than one meeting, <coughs> use specific forms, and use a specific strategy for DNA analysis. At the very beginning, I mentioned this process is done with the families. Uh, it's also a different approach at the traditional forensic world. We try to work with them before, during, and after, explaining what we want to do, what they want to do, which is very often is more important what we want to do, respecting their times. Uh, usually, as I mentioned before, we work in rural contexts. We had to go to the people, the people that had the possibility to go to the cities. Um, and we try to recover all, as much information as possible, pictures, uh, documents, trying to reconstruct the events with them in the site of the killings. And searching the cemeteries, as in some countries where cemeteries have been the main place to dispose of the bodies. Using photography, this is from Argentina, the province of Cordoba, using old pictures to reconstruct the location of a mass grave inside a cemetery. Or sometimes using sad images to reconstruct what happened. This is a, an area where was this very famous detention camp in Argentina called ESMA. This is a picture from 1978. We are looking for bodies in that area. The area was built when this was the river. This is a new area after 1978, and we try to reconstruct what happened in that area. And the main, main work in Argentina is in cemeteries, where the, the bodies were disposed in different ways, particularly individual graves. So using the approach of archaeology, we try to recover the remains, and expose the remains to try to establish what happened with them, the disposition inside the graves. And to the archaeology, we can see different indications of what happened in the process. For example, these two people were buried face down. We never buried someone in that condition during a normal process, so we can indicate the judicial authority something not regular happened during the burial process. We are able to recover very specific elements as personal belongings, like this iris in this person, a wheel around the neck, the position of the bullets, which is very important to establish the cause of death. Very often in this kind of investigation, there is an official version about what happened, which very often is consistent with a confrontation between a guerrilla group and the state forces. And what we can see to the analysis of the remains, the recovery of the bullets, very often are executions and no confrontations. So it's a typical archaeological war applied to a very particular context with different times and different possibilities. This is the biggest mass grave we found in Argentina with more than 180 bodies in the province of Cordoba. Until month and month of war was possible to recover these remains. And then we buy the third step of the lab with the lab, the, the, sorry, the third step of the war, which is in the laboratory where we try to identify the remains, establish the cause of death, analyzing personal belongings, clothing, and trying to identify the remains, which are very difficult processes, because I mentioned before, we don't have a face, we don't have fingerprints, we have bones, which is quite complicated. Dentition is a very important part of the world, the work of the odontologists try to compare information provided by the families with what we find in the remains, which it's quite complicated because, as I mentioned before, most of the missing people, they don't have access to odontologists. There is no records about what happened with them. But to pictures, different incidents the person had when he was alive, we can compare and to come up with identifications. That's the general work we, we do investigating different cases. I brought one case from Latin America, which was one of our first investigations. And I brought this case in from El Salvador, in Central America, because it was probably the, the biggest massacre in the 70s and the 80s in Latin America, where 1,000 people were killed in six days by the Salvadorian army. Basically what happened, uh, this map of El Salvador in Central America, of a civil war in the 80s, finished in the early 90s, and in, a, in the north called Mosote was a small town, and in December 6, 1981, 
the Salvadoran armies with the support of the U.S. began a big operation to clean the area of all the guerrillas. The pattern in Central America is totally different. We're talking in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Chile, where people were kidnapped different cities in general, in going to the houses of the people. In Central America, in Colombia, or in Guatemala, the whole village was destroyed. Everybody was killed, like in the same model than in Vietnam. So the idea of that operation, which began in that day in December, was to clean the whole field of local population, just to confront the guerrilla. The guerrillas found about this operation, they left the area. Um, so the army began a right, this is the province of Morazan, in the north of El Salvador. Began an operation in sector December, bombing the area and then sending troops to the villages. Uh, ten days later, two journalists from the New York Times and Washington Post arrived to El Salvador to see what happened because the official version of the embassy, American embassy, was, was a confrontation between the groups. So they visited the area, they saw these bodies of people in the village of uh, El Mosote. They came back to the United States and published this uh, information. Um, nobody believed that. They said they were lying. Um, and nothing happened for ten years. So in 1991, to UN was established a truth commission of El Salvador, and this commission asked us to investigate this massacre as one of the main cases of what happened in the civil war in El Salvador. So we spent three months uh, first visiting the area, interviewing relatives, visiting uh, great sites, talking with people who, the families after the, the events, they come back from the mountains to try to bury the remains of the loved ones who were lying in the villages. Uh, this woman was one of the main witnesses, Rafina Almasa. And this was the time of the El Mosot. There were six little villages with around 300 people. Uh, what happened when the army arrived, they divided the children and the women from one side, the old men from the other side, and they, they began to kill everybody <coughs> along during this, this operation. And this case in Mosote was important because uh, this is a building close to the charge of the village. This is the church in the back. And in this small building, the priest who came to, to give mass every Sunday used to change clothing to leave his things. According to the witnesses, the army concentrated all the children of the village in this building and they began to kill the children. So the condition put by the government, with the government of Salvador for us to work in this case was to provide training to all the forensic uh, personnel in the Salvador. So we want to work with the local specialists trying to reconstruct what happened in the village. You can see part of the borders, the foundations of the house, the entrance of the house. And during 45 days, we're trying to reconstruct what happened with the killing. Um, when the first time we were working with children, um, the bones were very small. When we began to discover children, the government said, the, what happened was the guerrillas were fighting with a child in front of them, that's why we have children in the grave, so trying to, to stop the process. Fortunately, the Truth Commission asked us to continue this part of the investigation. This is the whole area, around five meters by seven. And we found the toys of the children, the clothing. And we tried to locate in a map to explain to the commission what happened, the location of the bodies, but the ballistic evidence, which was very important. This is part of the, the end of the recovery process. And this is a map of what happened. This, uh, the, the walls of the building collapsed, and then the roof, and then in around 50 centimeters we found 153 bodies of children around eight years old. These two maps show the distribution in one side, there are the, the heads of the children, and the other shows the caliber, the bullets and the cartridge cases associated with the children. In 40 cases, we were able to establish that the children were killed uh, when we were already lying on the floor. <coughs> Some of the holes. This, this, uh, our report was sent to the Truth Commission of El Salvador. Um, and also caused a big impact in the United States because for this journal is a virtual special issue about the massacre of El Mosote um, in 1992. The March, the commission presented a report, and unfortunately, three months, three months later, 
the Salvadorian Parliament declared amnesty for all the persons involved in this in this process. This is just a, a, an example of the concrete cases today. El Mosote is a, a new village, so there is a process of memorization and um, uh, reparation in the area. And I would like to, to, to finish mentioning why I am in Australia. In 2005, Dr. Sullenblatt from the Victoria Institute of Forensic Medicine uh, uh, contacted us to try to work together in East Timor. As you know, between 1975 and 1999, East Timor had a process of donations being invited in the country. Um, and the idea of this project, this joint initiative between Argentina and Australia, was to provide training to the local police, the new police in East Timor, and also to try to investigate one of the main cases, the massacre of Santa Cruz in 1991. In 2007, we we'll signed a memorandum of understanding between the Victorian Institute and the government of Timor del Este, where we began to work together with them. And in 2009, the government requested us to keep working in other cases in, in, in East Timor. The main case that we have been working is the massacre of Santa Cruz, uh, different cases related to 1975 and after that period, but basically providing training to the to the local police and hospital staff. It's a project supported by OSI, but also by the Argentine government and other private donors. Uh, the preliminary results of these cases, 11 bodies were identified related to the massacre of Santa Cruz. For the first time, the family had the opportunity to recover the remains and to bury them. Uh, nine bodies were found in our area where we are working at the moment. Training of prosecutors, uh, police, and hospital staff. The development of an NGO which is dedicated now to this kind of cases and the government awareness and issues associated with missing issues in East Timor in a, in a slow process but which is beginning. As always we mentioned in this process the participation of the families is very important for us trying to explain them what we are doing, respecting their rituals, their times. Uh, here are some pictures of the work done in, in East Timor, collecting blood samples, working in, in the field. Um, sharing with the families our impressions, our comments, and taking decisions with them, and the process of identification of the victims. Doesn't matter the context, doesn't matter uh, where we are working. For the families, it's always the same process, trying to find the remains, trying to identify them, to get official acknowledgement about what happened, uh, to have the rituals in front of society. Very often the families say, we knew what happened, we knew what are the graves, but nobody believed us. But to this process of recovery, the remains and identification, it's possible not to bring the people alive back, but at least to provide some relief to the families. And for them to have a grave, where they can put a flower, visit the grave when they want, <clears throat> and play all the rituals they want at any moment. But at the same time, to provide evidence in different processes related to truth, to justice, and to memory. Thank you very much.